Well, good morning, church family. That was pretty good. Let's try it again. Good morning. Hey, so good to see y'all. Isn't it great to walk in and actually feel a little bit cool? You know, for many of y'all know, some of y'all may not, but we moved here about, I guess about five months ago now from Houston, four or five months ago, and, um, and they don't get this kind of weather in Houston, but like one time a year. So it's so nice to feel the cool and actually read the long-term forecast and see that it kind of stays this way for a while. So it's good. Hey, if you have your Bibles this morning, I want to encourage you to begin to turn to Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to continue in this series we've called Who We Are. Who We Are, Ephesians chapter 3. And as you're turning there, you've probably heard this phrase before, if uh, probably in the not too recent past, and it's a phrase that sounds something like this, make your lives bigger than yourselves, or be a part of something that's bigger than yourself. You know, we read it, if you were to Google that on the internet, you probably would find all of these different things that would come up, different slogans or sayings or organizations that kind of employ some sort of variants of that, that be a part of something bigger than yourself. You see it with kind of self-help books that are, here's how you make your life meaningful, or maybe a life coach is going to kind of steer you in that direction of, hey, make your life bigger than, than just you are, right? We see it with altruistic organizations, with those things that um, give to the community in different places. It's kind of that, that moniker to get people to join that organization or to be a part of it. And then even, I think we've seen it... I, in sports, right? So you have a, a baseball team that marches toward the pennant. Maybe they win the world championship. Or you have uh, the football team that wins a Super Bowl or whatever that might be. And then at the end, you know, the focus is on the star and he kind of comes on. and Maybe doesn't say those words exactly, but something like really this is a team effort. It's bigger than one person. All of that, right? And so all of us at some point, maybe even said that, make your lives about something bigger than yourself. This morning, as we look at this passage, I think it's going to reveal something. And if we're not careful when we say those words, make our lives bigger than ourselves, and we decide to jump into some organization or something that we can be a part of, what we find is really we've still kind of made it about us. Because I jump into this because I really want to feel good. I give here so I can kind of let kind of write it in my life's resume, if you will. And so if we're not careful, very quickly, when we try to make our lives about something bigger than we are, it can still really be about us. And this morning in the text, we're going to get to watch what God calls us to, which is not something that we would make our lives bigger or that we would make invest our lives in something bigger than we are, but that we would invest our lives in something eternal. Something that has a purpose that goes well beyond the next few years, decades, even centuries. And it's really not about our plans or the things that we get to push ourselves into, but we're going to watch as we read through these verses and explore them as this. It's really God's eternal purposes. And keying in on this one word that we are stewards, that we have a stewardship of everything that has been given to us in life. Either we use it for ourselves or we use it for the eternal purposes of God. So I invite you to stand with me in honor of reading God's word if you're physically able to do that. Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 13. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ 
and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. You can have a seat. So one of the things we begin to see in this passage beginning in verse 1 is that there is a mystery of the gospel that is revealed. There's this mystery that Paul begins to explain a little bit, the writer of Ephesians, about what this mystery is. But before that, he begins with this phrase, For this reason I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. And I think for us to understand this passage and to really uh, kind of make the correlation of what Paul is trying to say here, it's good for us to understand exactly what's going on and exactly who Paul was. We kind of alluded to it last week, but the story is that this, Paul had been planting churches and on his final kind of missionary journey, he goes back to Jerusalem and when he goes back, he reports back to the church and they are so excited to hear of all that's happening all over the world where Paul has gone and God has blessed him in the planting of church after church after church in these different cities. And there are some that are a little bit concerned because there's still this argument going back and forth, okay, do all these new people who have confessed Christ need to become Jewish, or how does this all work? And so they're working those things out as the church, but by and large, it is a good day when Paul returns. It was around the time of the feast, and Paul decides, as would have been his custom any time as a Jewish man, to go to the temple to pray, to worship God in that way, and then some things begin to happen. In Acts 21, 27 through 30, we read this. When the seven days were almost completed, speaking of the feast, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city. And they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. And all the city was stirred up and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple and at once the gates were shut. So understanding the background, Paul has gone through this after this final missionary journey and he gets arrested. And his arrest is what prompts this story to begin to unfold where he, he is put before the Sanhedrin and the Sanhedrin rules that they couldn't agree, essentially they ruled they couldn't agree on anything. They begin arguing about the resurrection of the dead, which Paul kind of dissuades him in that. And then there's a plot to take his life. And so Paul eventually, through all of that, appeals to Caesar, which means at one point he's going to go to Rome. And as he begins this journey to Rome, much happens on the way, but he finds himself in Rome in chains, housebound as a prisoner, where he's writing this letter to the Ephesians. It's amazing to think it's because of Trophimus, the Ephesian, that Paul is now writing to the Ephesians saying, I am in prison in Christ on your behalf. It's pretty incredible to connect those dots, but not only that, Paul's writing to this church, himself in prison. This is the most unexpected messenger of the gospel that we could imagine. And let me back up even further in the story of Acts and make that make and, and let us let's see that where that makes sense. In Acts chapter seven, the church is growing by leaps and bounds, and there's this one guy, one of these newly appointed deacons. His name is Stephen, and as he's sharing the gospel and sharing his faith and going through what is the normal life now for him as a follower of Jesus, he gets arrested, and at the end of it all, he shares his faith one more time and then is stoned. And there's one guy who's there holding the coats and very much approving of his execution. Saul, who would later become Paul. And here's what the story says in Acts chapter 8. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But get this, but Saul was ravaging the church. 
Entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Saul began ravaging the church. He began doing everything he could, zealous in every aspect of his life, to try to rid the Jewish people of this false prophet named Jesus and his followers. And in his mind, he was going to destroy the church. Even so much so beyond Jerusalem that he got these papers where he's on the road to the city called Damascus way away. And all of a sudden this blinding light appears and it's Jesus himself who changes Paul's direction forever. Here's what Paul would say about himself in Philippians 3, 3 and 7. It says, for we are the circumcision who worship by the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Get this, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. If we could understand who Paul was, that he is the perfect but most unexpected messenger of the one who would take the gospel to the Gentiles. And Paul, this Pharisee of Pharisees to zeal no one matched, is now in prison because he was changed so drastically by the gospel and began reaching to those very people who he hated most. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Paul goes on, and it says, Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how this mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written Briefly, He's saying, I've written briefly this story. You've heard it by now. But I want us to key in on one word right there, and that's this word, stewardship. Paul, in his life, saw everything as stewardship, that everything that he had been given, every talent he had, every material possession, every bit of it, he was a steward for the eternal purposes of God. Think about that in our own lives for a moment. Do we see the world through the lens of stewardship? That every material possession that you and I have, that every bank account that you and I might have, that everything that we possess is really on loan and we have been given stewardship of it for the eternal purposes of God. And not only that, but time. One of the most, if one of the most, if not the most precious commodity in our day and age is time. Do we steward our time for the purposes of God? If I can say it this way also of parents in the room, do we teach that stewardship by what we model in our home? Because what we model, our kids will likely follow in. Multiplied times three. Do we model what's valuable and what's important? Do we steward the kingdom and our resources and our time? And finally, in the people that we know. Do we realize that all of those people that are in our circles of influence, all of those people that we work with, all of those people that are in our neighborhoods, all of those people we go to school with and sit next to, all of those people in our lives are really put there because God has put us there and there's no coincidence and there's no accident. We are called to be a light to those, to steward them as gifts. Paul looked through this lens of stewardship in every aspect of who he was in every aspect of his life. So we see this lens of stewardship. Not only was he the perfect person, but verse 4 goes on to tell us more about this mystery. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations. 
as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit. If I could say it this way, not only was it the perfect person, it was the perfect timing. God, in his amazing wisdom, from the beginning began this process of reconciliation. From the moment Adam and Eve sinned and he killed the animal and clothed them with it to provide their needs, it was a precursor of what would one day come when Jesus would be killed for the sins of the world. It was the beginning of the plan of restoration. And all along, those in the past looked forward to the coming day when God would truly restore all things. And they didn't know the details. They didn't know his name would be Jesus. They didn't know the Messiah in specificity. But they looked forward almost in this cloud, hoping, knowing that God would one day continue this restoration that he began back then, knowing that one day there would be a marked point of his salvation. And we have the privilege now of looking back on this side of history, and recognizing that Jesus is literally the middle point of history. It all led to him, and now we all look back to him at what God continued and began in that in his life, this restoration of all things. Not only was it the perfect person to take this message, this mystery, it was the perfect time. So then what do we know about this mystery? What is it? And he begins to lay it out in verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. The mystery is this. It's not just that Gentiles can hear the gospel too. It goes so much deeper than that. It's that they're fellow heirs. Now what does that mean? It means that this guy, Paul, who was a murderer, self-righteous Pharisee of Pharisees, could be transformed by the gospel and literally sent to the ones he hated most to give the message of eternal life. And it meant that on this side, these Ephesians who he's writing to most were the most pagan of pagan, those who were the most self-focused in their world. They didn't care about anyone else. It was all about me. I will use you to get to the things I want and need. Life is all about me in the most pagan sense. And he transforms them to where literally not only would they become fellow heirs, but they would be members of one body. And it's the same story in our lives. That some of us in this room, if we could tell our story, have been transformed from the most egregious sins and situation. And we've watched what Jesus has done, and it's a totally different. If we were to go back 20 years and find the people we were with then, they would say, who are you? And what's great about this is when God begins to redeem and reconcile and restore is that he uses your gifts and my gifts and your abilities and my abilities and he brings all of it together under this thing called the body of Christ where he is the head and we are the body and we march forward under his direction that we're no longer separate, we're one. Fellow heirs of the gospel, members of one body, partakers of the promise Galatians 3, 27 to 29 says, For as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's slave nor free. There's no male or female. You're all one in Christ. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And we are heirs that there is a promise that has been made going all the way back. And we inherit that promise as adopted sons of the promise and daughters of the promise. That we hold on no matter what happens in this life. There is an eternity that waits and we are stewards of those God's eternal purposes. Paul goes on and he begins to focus a little more on himself in this. And he says, of the gospel, I was made a minister to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to life for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Paul essentially begins to look at himself and in wonder and humility and amazement, he stands back and basically says this. 
God began this from so long ago. And right now, in this time, Jesus has come and he's reconciling all things to himself. And for whatever reason, I have been made the steward of this message to reveal what the mystery is that will change everything forever. And I think in a very real way, Paul wasn't just being humble in the moment where he's kind of this contrived humility where he says, I'm the least of all the saints. I think this was at the end of his life and he was growing closer and closer to Jesus all throughout the journey. And here's the reality. When we grow closer to Jesus, we recognize the weight of our own sin and all that Jesus has done for us. We recognize his mercy and his grace that has been lavished upon us. And we recognize that there's nothing we could have done. There's nothing good in us apart from Jesus. He goes, this was my role. It had nothing to do with me. Praise be to God for his glory. You know, each one of us have a role. Can you imagine Paul in that moment standing there looking at the crux of history unfolding before him saying, why me, why now? But I've been called to be this steward, the guy who persecuted the church, the guy who was angry, the guy who was against Christ in the beginning has somehow been saved and now I'm opening the door in what would be years and years, 2,000 years later that we sit in this room and worship because of Paul's witness and faithful testimony and those like him. What's your story? What's your role? And could it be that there are days like today in Paul's life, like that day, where we might look and go, God, I never could have imagined what you wanted to accomplish in my life. But everything changed when I chose to live stewarding the eternal purposes of God. We have a role in God's story. Will we follow it? He goes on after this mystery is revealed. In verse 10, he gets kind of the second piece of this. And he says, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities. And I love this. He begins to basically say, the church is the plan. The church is the plan to reveal the manifold wisdom of God. And many of us don't use the word manifold in our lives, right? It's not something that comes up at dinner in conversation a lot, unless you're restoring an old car, right? And you get the the manifold and all of that that you would need to repair. Uh, But the deal is, and you can tell my knowledge of cars as I'm just spouting that out, this exhaust manifold, for those of you who are shaking your head, okay, good. So we're all in confusion. So... We don't use this word. What it means is multifaceted, many-sided. If you can imagine it this way, that, that all of these kind of streams and tributaries and creeks of the wisdom of God all flow into what would be this river of his ultimate plan. God in his amazing wisdom can work anything for his good and for his glory. And so he brings all of that together in this beautiful tapestry, in this beautiful display this manifold wisdom of God where he's working all things. And it says the church then is through the conduit through which he works so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now what does that mean, the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places? I think Paul is stretching their minds to even say, hey, beyond this physical world, beyond what you can see right now, here's some other passages, 1 Peter 1.12, things onto which the angels long to look. Colossians 1, 19 and 20, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell that through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross in earth or in heaven. Ephesians 1, 19, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, and authority, and power, and a dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. I think in these moments, he's bringing their heads up to look and say, this is not only the restoration that's taking place in the lives that you see right now, but God is restoring all things. 
There's a friend of mine who says it this way, kind of in four attributes, that God is restoring. When he restores all things, he's restoring first and foremost our relationship to God as his creation. Then he restores our relationship to one another. And he restores, if you can think of it this way, our relationship to ourselves, understanding our true identity is found in Christ and who he created us to begin to be to begin with. And then the fourth thing is that literally he restores our relationship even with nature. Because God created a perfect world in the beginning. And every aspect of that has been stained by sin. It flows through all of it when Adam and Eve brought it into creation. And the scripture says that we chose to sin as they did for all have fallen short of the glory of God and sinned. It is the reason Jesus came. It's the story of the gospel. Because of that sin, Jesus came because God from the very beginning said, I will redeem my people. I will reconcile them. And sending Jesus was the crux of that point in history when he would come becoming the perfect sacrifice where he would take our sins on him and die, defeating them, rise from the grave, defeating death. That if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. The sins are forgiven. It's like an accountant's book that we have been reconciled and all of the debt is done away with. We are made right with God. He is in reconciling all things in heaven and on earth. And the church is his conduit to reconcile. It's our job to fulfill the eternal purposes that God has. This is his plan. And it makes our gathering really important. If we could get it in our minds, think back to what this church was going through in Ephesus and that every aspect of their daily life was a struggle. Every aspect of their daily life was hard because they had to decide whether or not they would worship the gods of Rome or the God of the universe. They had to decide even though it meant their lives were negatively impacted every moment of every day if they were going to be obedient and follow. And so when they came together and gathered at the church, you can imagine the joyfulness they would have getting to worship together and sing to God and be in the company of those who believed like they believed and to hug each other's necks and to say, hey, keep going, you're going to make it. I'll give you whatever you need to get you there. We'll all pull our resources and we'll do this together because this is the reality and we have a world that believes very differently. And so many years have gone by in our culture where church attendance, if you will, check in the box has just become that. Our gathering matters because we are the church who has an eternal purpose. But if we never get that eternal purpose, then our gathering will never matter. Not only does our gathering matter, but our going matters. Because we carry that eternal purpose. We carry the gospel. Verse 11 says this, this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. In our day, it is very easy for the church to get sidetracked into a lot of good things and forget our eternal purposes. Francis Chan put it this way in a conference he recently spoke at. He's a a great preacher if you're not familiar with him. He says, we live in a time when Christians are starting to change their theology because they're ashamed of the words of Christ, because it's not popular. We can busy our lives with good things that aren't the most important thing. And I feel like there's a cop-out in Christianity today. Many are willing to care for the poor, fight human trafficking, work toward racial reconciliation. And those are good things, good, important biblical issues. But I'm just noticing that there are very few people who are spreading the gospel. We are called to an eternal purpose. As the church, we are called to glorify God by making disciples of every generation and serving the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's who we are. 
as a staff, we've begun talking about and thinking about what are the things in our church that are maybe even really good things, but they're distracting us from our eternal purposes. Because as the church, I think one of the worst things that could be said of us is that we did a lot of good things, but we never made an eternal difference. We don't want to be a church that does a lot of good things. We want to be a church that has an eternal purpose to see lives transformed by the gospel. And that means, in a lot of ways, getting simple and direct. Because we want to be the church, the body of Christ. And that's his mission and purpose. So how do we do it? Verse 12, it says, In whom we have boldness in Christ, we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. I love that word boldness there. You, you see it in Paul's life when Paul marched into places with incredible boldness, not having a single believer in a city that he knew of as he would walk in and face the many gods and go and argue at, the, at Mars Hill and in Athens or in various different places, even in Ephesus. He would go to these lecture halls. He would go to the synagogue, anywhere, and just boldly proclaim the gospel. But not only that, look back to our Savior. You know, so many times we've mentioned this in the past that we see these movies about Jesus and um, he's English and has the long flowing blonde hair and blue eyes and all that stuff. And sometimes it can almost come across that he's weak. The Bible presents a very different picture of a Savior who is very bold and strong. It doesn't mean at times he's not gentle. He is even with all of us. But gentleness does not equate to weakness. There are some times Jesus walked in and he face-to-face and he -face confronted the religious leaders of the day who held all the cards in terms of control and power. Jesus walked into the temple and turned over the tables and said, this is my father's house, it's a house of prayer. Jesus was the one who at one of the most prominent moments in a celebration in, in the end of a feast, this water libation where they're asking God to bless the rains for the harvest and they're pouring the living water or this water that would come out of this jar. Jesus cries out in the midst of thousands, says, I am the living water. He was bold. Jesus had chutzpah. We are called to be bold. To not cower down because it's not politically correct to have the conversation. But to stand on the truth of the gospel with gentleness and respect, with love, but proclaim the truth. To live it out in our lives and with our words. With boldness. Imagine the encouragement that was to that culture in Ephesus that had nothing and he said, be bold because Jesus was. Be bold because I'm writing to, this, to you from prison because I was bold when I went back to Jerusalem. Boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. How can we be so bold because we have access, access with confidence? Hebrews 4 puts it this way. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who every respect in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That we can go to our heavenly father who loves us and say, God, would you give me what I need? Would you give me the boldness I need? God, would you give me the strength that I need? God, would you give me the words to say? And you know what? He waits and he gives. Because we have access through Jesus Christ with confidence. And the last thing Paul says in this part. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Paul, who is in prison, knows in some ways they may feel some guilt. And he says, don't worry about me, what I'm suffering on your behalf. James 1, 2, and 4 puts it this way. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. 
Jesus in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Not long after this was written, another guy named Tertullian, who was one of the first Christian apologists around 150 A.D., said it this way, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of faith. Don't worry when they persecute. Why is that important for us? Because as we march toward the truth and we say we want to be stewards of the eternal purposes of God and speak the truth, our culture is not going that way. And more and more and more, it will take boldness and confidence in Christ. And it may cost us something. So, the mystery has been revealed. The church, Parkway Hills, you and I are the plan. Let us be bold with confident access, knowing the resources are limitless from our Heavenly Father to go forward and engage the eternal purposes of God, not something bigger than ourselves, but something that will last forever. Would you bow your heads? Close your eyes. Would you just ask God right now, just in a moment of quiet, God, where am I not stewarding all that you've been given, all that you've given me for your eternal purposes? And then as he reveals it in your heart, would you just surrender those things to him? bowed and eyes closed. In a moment, we're going to have an opportunity just to respond. And feel free to respond however God leads you. If you're going through something and you need prayer this morning, being the first service person came forward who just learned they were fighting a battle with cancer and just needed prayer. It's what we're here for, our staff and our prayer partners, anything that's going on. But also, if you're here today and you have not been reconciled to Christ, if you have not received forgiveness that comes through him for your sins and you've been trying so hard in whatever way you can to find purpose, to find meaning, and you realize today that it's all fallen short because it always will. That God stands ready to hear you. He stands ready to make you new. Scripture says you can be born again. And if that's you, would you just come down also during this time of response as others are coming, myself or some of our staff prayer partners, we'd love to talk with you more about that decision. Wherever God is leading you this morning, however he leads you to respond, as a moment after I pray, we're going to sing, respond, and follow his leading. Father, we are thankful for the scriptures. God, we are thankful for these words that encourage us, that challenge us, God. Would we be those who are bold and confident to go forward? God, would our lives matter in the eternal for your glory and for your kingdom. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we sing and respond?